This is how we get to do it. So we were talking, actually, I was sharing how I look back to what I learned um, when I was at university. I went to Un- University of South Florida, Go Pulse, Tampa. And at the time, I'm like, man, I'm learning so much. I know it all. And then 30 years, no, almost 30 years removed of, you know, originally um, being in college. It's like, man, you know, at 22, 24 years old, I didn't, I really didn't know that much. You know, I look (laughs) back on 25 plus years of continuing education and experience And it's like, holy cow, that young kid didn't really know crap. I mean, I'm learning new items on a week by week basis, like you and I were talking about before we went live here. Yeah, but there's the value in that. Like you have to have continuing education, whether that's formal and structured and officially done with a certificate or whether that is because you're engaging with research that's coming out, you're in forums, you're talking to people, you're having the conversations that are going to stretch you and you're staying open-minded. And this is the big thing that I find so often in academia is that you get close-minded and become a bit fossilized, right? And you refuse to believe that there's something that's different, that's changed from what you learned because you've been doing it for 40 years. And so it must be gospel truth, right? So staying on your toes and, um, and, and constantly evolving your approach, refining it, chucking out the bits that are old science, bringing in that, you know, you've got to do that to be meaningful. That's so good. Yeah. It was just when you said, you know, we, we do the same thing. We, we learned that over and over and over, whether it's four years, six years, in your case, 11 years, there's consistency with that. And for survival reasons, we protect that, which is consistent. So it's right. like, Ooh, I can't believe differently than what I believed originally because then who am I? What's my identity? So it's, it's great going in, like you just mentioned on have an open mind and look for ways to, the way I'm interpreting that is look for ways to squash the belief that we had yesterday. And it'll be either constant proof that no, this, this is what we know to be solid today, or like, wow, there's new evidence, there's new data. There's more than one way for this, which is really cool. So I've got a couple of questions for you. Yeah, go ahead. So in last week's show, you were talking, uh, you you mentioned to me ways on not poisoning our animals, you know, to to get rid of the fleas and ticks. Um, So if you can highlight on that again, because we had like Chad um, mentioned, he's using one of the products that you had mentioned. And then he asked if it's in within the environment, is that enough? Or do we have to physically put it, put it on? So if you can highlight on what that item was and why you recommended that. Yeah, I think you probably talk about diatomaceous, diatomaceous earth, which is um, actually not even a clay. Like when you say, hear the word earth, you think oh, it's probably some kind of clay. It looks like clay, but it's actually microscopic skeletons of marine creatures. Um, and they're very jagged and sharp, which is why they make such a good internal parasite cleanser. Because it's like if you had thousands of blades of, of shards of glass flying at you, you'd probably jump out the way. Well, that's exactly what's going to happen to your intestinal worms, right? So diatomaceous earth works internally externally but on the body and externally in the environment it's amazing so you can put it into your carpets if you've got like a flea um, egg or flea infestation in in the carpets and soft furnishings and then just vacuum that out Um, you can sprinkle that in your yard and do similar things to kill those kinds of things if you've got um, ticks in the ground um, you can also use nematodes in the garden to do that but if you're actually having your pets have the fleas on their body, then yeah, you're going to want to put that on them as well. So it's you just do it as if it was like a talcum powder or some other kind of, you know, and I use a, a like a, a, a spice pot, like a, sh- a shaker thing from just like parsley or pepper or something. Right. And, and put the, put the animals in the bath so it doesn't go everywhere because they will shake and it <laughs> so it's easier just to clean it off in the bath or do it outside. Um, sprinkle it all onto their fur and then rub that in because it's no good just being on the top of the fur because as soon as they shake, it's going to all fly off. So you want to massage it into the fur a bit so it makes contact with the skin. It'll also do some nice drying things of any itchy spots and inflamed areas that you might have, but it's going to be now inescapable for those fleas and their eggs um, as they walk around your pet's body. That's awesome. (gasps) Diatomaceous earth. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So I want to make sure to put that in the comments on all of the social channels. That's good. So you're saying, I was thinking it was clay also. So you're saying it's not clay. It's actual, it's organic from sea life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So it's like the, the exoskeleton, which is why it's so acidic. So that's why it works so brilliantly on the exterior of our pets, because it acts like acid rain on the exoskeletons of these critters that are biting and sucking the blood of our animals, right? So, um, it, but the reason that is because they're a marine creature and they're having to survive in those environments. So there's a strong calcium carbonate thing in there and other bits and pieces. So. Awesome. And then like I had ordered a food grade. So you're saying that I can take that internally? Yes. Don't use the non-food grade with pets um, because they will groom. Even if you're putting it on the outside of them, it must be the food grade version. It's safer. It's more effective. And then when they groom. Say that one more time in case that person that's watching now (laughs) get distracted. It It must must be. be, It must be food grade diatomaceous earth to use for your pets. Awesome. Awesome. And then what I saw was my wife and I were looking at it and it's like, it doesn't say anything on there about the pets. So in, in the, in the product that I found, it's Amazon. Welcome to my, my number one shopping. Um, so even if it doesn't say that, you know, as a zoologist that, Hey, that's, that's what we use. Mm-hmm. You will sometimes see it being suggested for, for hens for dust bathing, because it'll kill any parasites and mites and feather mites and things that they get under their wings. Um, for, so dust bathing, in diatomaceous so again you're going to want to have the food grade i i my with the opinion you should always have the food grade the safest the, the purest the most organic the most human grade allowed version for your pets because why are they any less than you so good um i have another question yeah so my nose is red right now i've been sneezing unbelievably my sinuses have been having overstuffed okay. a- allergens attacking and with the summits that you do, outside of your, your extensive knowledge, you also work with experts, worldwide experts on the human body and, and different yeah. animals. You had mentioned two things to me. So if you can, if you can repeat that. So more than yeah, just so, me can learn. So if you, have, if you have an infection, so you can, have, you can have an allergic reaction, right? So that's going to be a histamine response because something's being triggered but you don't have a bacterial infection so you can tell when you sneeze into that tissue by looking at what color it is whether or not you have the bacterial infection so that will be when you start getting some of those technicolors if you're sticking with clear then it's it's an irritation your body's trying to flush out so you you would do a different approach but if you have the bacterial infection you want an antibacterial right but you do not want to be taking an antibiotic an antibiotic for that kind of thing is just going to decimate the healthy microbiome that you have in your oral cavity and also in your gut if you're taking it orally. So you I'm going to pause on that real quick. If you haven't heard that before, taking an antibiotic is like an atomic bomb inside your body. You kill right. not only the bad bacteria, but you're killing all of the great gut biome as well. So be aware if you take an antibiotic, studies show that on average, it takes two years to recuperate the gut biome that you had pre the antibiotic. So unless you purposely go in with with a pre-designed how do i rebuild my gut biome you've lowered your immune system for minimum two years by taking antibiotics so i wanted i wanted to to add that cherry on that one so please that's continue. a good point yeah it, it goes it, it's just they should be used in life-threatening situations and not much else and the good thing is you can kill bacteria in other ways you don't have to use it, you know, an antibiotic to kill it, right? And so colloidal silver is an impressive product, very natural, doesn't have that decimating effect on your microbiome, but it will kill a bacterial invader. It will get rid of that infection. Garlic essential oil will do the same thing. So we're not talking about garlic infused in olive oil, which will be delicious in your salad. I'm talking about garlic essential oil, which will probably knock your socks off when you take the lid off. It's really pungent, right? But it's incredibly effective. And all you need to do is inhalation on that, right? You don't have to eat it. You, you probably don't want to eat it, right? Um, but that that inhalation, getting it all the way through those nasal passages, those molecules get into your bloodstream incredibly quickly, right? You think about it, you're taking a breath in of air, that oxygen that you've breathed in is getting into all of your body within a few seconds. That's how quickly True. inhalation True. works in terms of it, as a medicinal factor. So the essential oils that are highly antimicrobial um, are, are just far superior at getting the job done because you don't have that decimating side effect. Awesome. Yeah, I haven't heard of the garlic. I heard of oregano. 
as mm -hmm. far as that high end antimicrobial antiviral. So that's good. So that'll be added to my essential oils, the garlic. That's good. You use the term medicinal. I want to come back to that because that's that was really the topic I want to talk about today. You had a couple of questions for me. Let's address that and then and then we'll go into the medicinal side. Yeah, so I was I was learning about lymph. Um, the lymphatic system is phenomenal. If you don't know about it, that's maybe something else we can talk about or you can dig into that. But the, the, the lymphatic system doesn't have a pump the way the heart has a pump. So the only way that you get that flow going in your body is your own movement. But where I had this question, because it was saying that if you, if you are working um, with great resistance and you're like doing strength training, building up that muscle, bulking up, yet that's going to motivate and move your lymph in one way. But if you're doing a yoga and a, and a more Pilates, a lengthening of the muscle that's kind of implying here, that that's going to do things differently. So then that made me super curious. It's like, okay, when we're doing these different exercises, I'm like, what are we actually doing to our muscles? What, how are we bulking it up or how are we leading it out? Or is that not a thing? Yes and no. Okay, so you're talking about stretching and you're talking about strength training. So we have, think lymphatic, um, we have a sympathetic and a parasympathetic. So para, think parachute. So that's the, I want to slow down my adrenals because we really can't shut off anything. So I want to, if I'm, if I'm in adrenal fatigue, where I'm always in that panic fight flight zone, the parasympathetic, the stretching, the breathing, that yoga, the flexibility, the foam rolling, the massage, that that's all supportive and when when we're massaging foam rolling mild exercise heavy exercise we we are activating the lymphatic system yes now how the muscle strands are stimulated that's different so when you look at the muscle fibers there's a spectrum from from the thin fibers to the thick fibers so they, they would call it slow slow twitch medium twitch fast twitch you know, at one, one point in time when they were doing this, the research and the studies and they identified that, they thought it was really three, but it comes to be thousands. They just seem to be within that category. You know, we've got right. so many that, that are quote unquote, slow twitch, medium, fast twitch. Genetically, we're predisposed to having more of one versus another. This is where, where people talk about body types, mm -hmm. mesomorph, ectomorph, you know, it's uh, how, how much of these fiber strands that somebody genetically have. So you'll see some people genetically or not, not counting inflammation are genetically thicker as far as their muscle tissue versus others are leaner. And those are pretty, you, you can see that with athletes, athletes at a young age, you do something that's fun and it's fun because you get rewarded. So it's like, Oh, they clapped for me. Oh, they gave me a high five. Oh, I got a trophy. Let me do more and more of that. So the leaner, taller individual is going to excel at basketball. They're going to excel at volleyball. The, the shorter, stockier, wrestling, gymnastics. So just sprinting. Genetically, we're predisposed more in one way versus the other. Now to stimulate muscle growth, you've got to put stress on that muscle tissue. Yeah. And in the strength training, we're looking at, at doing movement to where the body, that muscle can't move anymore. So then the fibers actually break down. We get the hormonal signals that goes into protein synthesis. That's, oh, let's, let's rebuild the tissue and let's hypertrophy. Let's get thicker with that. So it's, it's not that a yoga move versus a strength move is going to be different. It's, it's different in the sense of one is stabilizing so, so I'm activating my proprioceptors. What, what's, what's the neuro response, uh, um, the nervous system within, within the muscle fibers, you know, if, from my toes, literally to my head, if I lift up one foot, there's so many neurons activating just to stabilize me, just to keep me in balance. I you welcome back to gymnastics that burns a lot of calories. So the more we activate brain, the more we activate the nervous system, it's using tons and tons and tons of energy. So this is where some individuals are like, man, I was exhausted. And all I did was a stretch class because you were activating so many of the proprioceptors to stabilize you. Um, Interesting. And then on the strength side, we're tearing the fibers and they rebuild. One thing that, that I found interesting with this is um, Dr. Lyons is, is uh, in my opinion, heading the message and the research with this. 
when we consume 30 to 35 grams of protein, animal protein, so about five grams of L-leucine uh, and amino, we stimulate protein synthesis as well. Where at one point we believed the only way to do that was resistance training. We can actually do that with consuming a certain amount of protein or, or um, I'll leave it at that, within, within a small window. Exactly what that window is, uh, they don't know precisely, but we're guesstimating 30 to 45 minutes. So it's interesting that you can potentially stimulate that lymphatic system by how and what you consume food-wise. It's so cool. I mean, again, as I mentioned earlier, we just learn more and more as we continue to, to peel the layers of knowledge. Human body is so fascinating. Um, that was a long rabbit trail to, to go into, into what you asked. So is those three, but there's hundreds of them, those three kind of block types of muscle fibers are going to dictate the, the shape of muscle that you have or the thickness of muscle that More you have? More thickness. The shape is the shape. And, that, and that's, that's predisposed to, to DNA. You know, the, the shape of a certain muscle for a dog is going to be a little bit different than, than a giraffe. Um, than the human, but we know the deltoid muscle is shaped the way that it is. Now, the thickness of it is what's my genetic disposition with that? How much you, you, do I have more endurance muscles for that? So I'm going to be great at tennis with the endurance, or do I have more of the fast twitch, the thicker ones where I'm going to be fantastic for like a CrossFit where, where I'm lifting heavy load or fast load. So it's, it's thinking of there's a, there's a, there's a spectrum of speed and and strength you know and power comes somewhere in between when you combine strength and speed so the the energy used by a pitcher is equivalent to the energy used from a power lifter they're they're on the end of the spectrum for each one and the genetics on those fibers will will dictate the thickness of that um so sometimes a little side story here i would have individuals say i don't want my thighs to be as thick and they're doing Stairmaster. Well, the Stairmaster's stimulating more of the fast switch fibers that they had within that region and area. And you can, you can hypertrophy specific muscles. You can't oxidize fat in a specific area. So fat seems to be more like the tide. It, it all comes down or it all goes up. And mm -hmm. I may have five layers of fat here. This is why you see more definition in my arm and 5,000 in my love handle, this is why, oh man, I still have a pooch. So layers of fat and layers of muscle, how you activate specific areas, completely different. Wow. That's another conversation. <laughs> that's a fun conversation. Then let's do that one next time. I'm game. Keep moving my little mic around. Um, what else with that? What else with that? So how do hormones play into that? Hormones dictate it all. I mean, they really do. It's, and you and I talked about this before. There's so many different hormones and they're all attached. It's like a, like a spider web. It's not just one. You, you, you mess with one, you're having a ripple effect with every single one. Um, testosterone, we know, stimulates the protein synthesis and muscle growth. So I have, I have a genetic disposition based on, on my genetics. However, I can, we've got hormone replacement therapy. We've mm -hmm. got testosterone replacement therapy. Um, so you can, you can shift and change that. You, you can, if you want to increase your testosterone, you can also supplement with vitamin D3 and DHEA. So there's a natural way of, of boosting T3, T4 that will help to really narrow it down and, and elementary level it, that'll boost your metabolism. That could help boost your metabolism. And as you grow the muscle fibers with muscle and movement is metabolism, you oxidize fat faster. So that's a quicker way for people to lean out. No doubt, no doubt. Or if the hormones aren't balanced, it'll be a challenge to activate that protein synthesis. You're saying when they're in out of balance, out of balance. Yep. Yeah. It's, you know, if it's out of balance, think of the spectrum of I'm sick on one side, I'm in multi pharmaceuticals and I'm a professional athlete on the other side. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. to be, to be at that level, 
the body's not ill. It's at hyper performance. Correct. So, so if I'm not at the hyper performance, my hormones are more than likely off here. So if I do, if, if I'm in the sick range and I'm doing activities, fitness activities of, of a hyper performer of an athlete, but I don't see the results because we haven't addressed the illness. We haven't addressed the sickness. We haven't addressed the imbalances of the hormones, potential diseases that, that are there. Once we go from the sick range to the not so sick to the healthy vitality, now we can start working on hyper high performance and hyper performance. So it's many times people will do a movement and they're upset that they're not seeing the results, not addressing that there's bigger blocks in the way. Let's, let's address the big issue. Hormones are off. Well, why are the hormones off? Oh, this is transitioning right to what I wanted to talk about. Hold on. <laughs> Celebrate for one second there. <laughs> that was awesome. Dude, we could like do a radio show. That was, that was really good. <laughs> wow. Dr. Zoo Little is a pro. So good. But you know what I love in that is because that that's exactly the same as how things work with the animals. Like when you have an animal that is one of your pets is is suffering from a disease, right? Which is the the label that we give to a cluster of symptoms, and the symptoms are coming from somewhere. Now you can put a drug on top of that to start to alleviate some of those symptoms, but you haven't addressed the root cause. You haven't addressed why are those symptoms establishing, right? So what you're talking about. If your, horm if your hormones are out of balance here, you're not going to be able to get that long-term effect. If, you're, if your symptoms are not being addressed at the root cause, you're not going to heal from that disease, nor are you going to increase your longevity. You have to address that first thing. So with what I'm teaching for longevity stuff, there's the seven pillars of things that we start to take pay attention to, to, to get to the root cause and to bring you up to that. And then once we're here, we can optimize with the biohacking and the zoo biohacking is phenomenal stuff. Like I love that. But with trying to balance those hormones that you just talked about, are we just looking at food or can we balance hormones through movement and exercise? It's both. It's both movement and exercise without a doubt helps. So, and, and that's been proven study after study after study for decades. So as we move our hormones begin to, to stabilize, and I will add the little caveat of, however, if I continue to poison my body and right. keep throwing my hormones out of whack, it's like, okay, which one's winning the race? So I'm, I'm, I'm starting to create momentum and I'm tying my shoelaces together and I keep tripping over myself. So it's, it's the, what is getting the hormones out of whack? And many times we go into, well, it's age, you're getting older. Thank you for that response. And, and <laughs> you know, if, if you're PG, cover your ears, that means nothing. <laughs> it's that's bull crap, you know, and, and this is the one thing that I love about the internet and, you know, like, like you and I communicating now, you have many visually proven individuals and animals that are old yet they're as healthy as somebody 20 30 plus years younger than them it's like oh mm -hmm. so so age is not a thing um i'm gonna ask you about your seven pillars as i blow my nose so i'm gonna mute this for for the listeners <laughs> and, then, and then i want to go on the like what dr hyman does where he prescribes food yeah yeah he's amazing but yeah, the, the seven pillars, like, so uh, uh, across everything that I learned over those five years of sort of studying the regenerative and functional medicine, there was information coming from so many sources. And I had to kind of work out a way, how do I synthesize this down into something that can be delivered in a very small space of time rather than having to force someone to do <laughs> five years of study, okay? And so I looked for the patterns. I could see it doesn't matter who I'm listening to, whole natural organic food is a pattern so that's pillar one species appropriate diet is my first pillar and so we're looking at food as nourishment but also food as medicine that's pillar one pillar two i have is detox because if you're not getting the trash out you are definitely not getting younger and fitter right uh so detox microbiome and so that is not just the gut microbiome although that's phenomenally important because we need that for our immune system we need that for our hormones we need that for our brain health because 80 percent of the information actually goes this way and 20 percent goes that way mm. it's just crazy but then also the oral microbiome we have a skin microbiome we have microbiomes everywhere but but 
nurture, how do we nurture that so they can continue to nurture us is really key. So that's number three, exercise and movement and alignment go into pillar four because if you're out of whack because your fascia is all crooked or your balance is out or whatever, right, how are you going to do? If you're not moving where you're not getting the lift, if you're not exercising how you're oxygenating and building strength and keeping your muscle mass and bone density and all that stuff, right? Um, then we look at natural environments and this is really, really neglected in the human space in my opinion and it's really neglected in pets. But when you think about it, every animal other than our pets lives outside in nature they're connected to the ground they connect they're in direct contact with like not direct contact but they're they're receiving sunshine they're having the effects of gravity and the force field of the earth and stuff like that when we live in a house especially if we're on a high rise you're disconnected from a lot of that stuff and all of the all of nature all of earth creation is working to your health so natural environments is super key um sleep and hormones is the next one uh, these are in no particular order, really, but this is just how I remember them. So sleep and hormones. So if you're um, so sleeping is part of your hormonal thing, but so is your sex hormones. And then you've got your appetite hormones and your stress hormones. So you, the hormones is, is a symphony and they are all connected. But the only time you heal is when you're asleep. So sleep is very important for a lot of that balancing of things and getting your hormones back on track. Uh, where am I up to? I think mental health is the only one that's left. Yeah, so stress and mental health. So we're looking there at the parasympathetic and the sympathetic autonomic nervous system. But we're also, particularly with respect to pets, going to be looking at your human-animal bond because your emotions will transfer to them. So if you come home stressed, you're knocking their mental health out. And the big factor here is boredom and lack of training, lack of sensory enrichment and lack of um, desensitization of scary things that most animals will run away from and we're asking our pets to be okay with that. So we need to help them overcome all those challenges too. Oh, this is <clears throat> so much to dig into, right? Yeah. It's one of those seven. Let's, let's just put this into perspective for one second. So there's seven. I can take you down probably 10 topics with each one of those seven. Okay, so now we're on 70. And with each one of those 10 topics, I've probably got 10 hacks or 10 upgrades or 10 tweaks that you can do to up level where you're going so we're not just building a foundation but we're really trying so we've got i don't know i've read a seven thousand seven thousand pieces of information so no 700 pieces of information before we get started I, I so, so here, here's my plug if you want to learn more that's where you get to hire dr zulittle she can you know she'll fly in and visit you on your yacht depending where you're at so good to go or your house. You can have a house too. <laughs> oh, you can have a house. My bad, my bad. I, I forgot you don't work with only super high-end clients. Not only, no. <laughs> Not only. For the rest of us commoner, if you want to hire Dr. Z, you can, you know, contact her down below. And the thing is, this is, this is what I love, is every just about everything that I speak to in all those things applies straight back to you, right? So if you're investing in this for your pet to live longer, you get to have all of those health benefits and longevity things you too. You get to age backwards, right? As you're extending the health span of your pets into the future so they're with you longer, you're aging backwards. You're becoming closer and closer to being 20 again. Same thing. It's it's amazing. And that's so we'll we'll wrap it up tying that into and we're gonna we're gonna dive deep into your seven points. And it's it's interesting that you know here I am with K7. Right. A lot of those, lot of those seven points overlap. So so cool. It's just it is what it is. You, you can't escape it. Uh, so Dr. Hyman um, really stands out for me. You know, it's, it's as far as my research and studies go, he's the first one that really popped into my radar of prescribing food mm -hmm. as medicine. It's the, we've identified that we can reverse so many of the diseases, type two diabetes, type three, which is Alzheimer uh, um, and dementia. It's it's been proven to be reversible, um, the heart disease as well. And it's all food-based. So, and this is the terminology that, that, that in my world is catchy, especially in the longevity. Cause if you haven't heard, I'm going to be 147 super active mobile individual is crap food, what I call kryptonite gets us sick. That's what's creating and pre-aging us. So, mm -hmm. you know, you, you yeah. and I've talked about, it's not about the age. Oh, it's, it's age related. It's like bullshit. It's purposely related based on the toxins that you're putting into your system. And 
real food, God given food heals us. Like it's, it's that simple. And I neglect how unknown that message is because I live in that world. You know, Mm -hmm. I surround myself with individuals that are anti-pharma. You know, it's, there's a time and place for emergencies, but not, Oh, this, Oh, I've got a little sinus infection. Let me take an antibiotic. And my, my world doesn't exist that way because we're aware that you just killed your immune system for a minimum of two years from that. And I forget that, that the general public, they're not aware that you can heal with food. They, they believe that the only way to get better is with pharmaceuticals, which actually speed up the death process, the, the non-living process. Let me put it that way. And, and it's exactly the same with pets too. And I appreciate what you're saying because, you know, I, I can get a little bit page blind about it too. I'm so used to living in a world where those things are not part of the daily practice um, and, and feeding my pets whole natural foods, the raw species appropriate diet that they would have. But I see daily from my, from clients, their pets are eating junk food. They're eating trash. It's, it can't even be called food. It's actually labeled feed legally because it cannot be called food because it's not safe, right? So it's called, it's classed as feed. And when you look at what your starting ingredients are, they're the worst of the worst that you can imagine. Like people go through an abattoir and they cut bits off that are deemed unsafe, right? There's bits of gangrene. There's bits that have, right? They've found the plastic ear tags of cows, right? In pet food. They find they find pets that have been put down in pet food, including the drug that killed them, right? We're not talking about a piece of meat that was slightly turning and a bit questioned. We're talking about things that should not be anywhere close to a bowl of any species being in there. And that's before they've been superheated six times. Wow. So talk about superheated. What, what, what happens with that? Well, you denature protein, right? As soon as you heat protein, protein is going to, proteins, the molecules are going to change shape and structure. Like we can see that when we cook an egg, right? It goes from clear to white. Right, we see that if we burn ourselves on our skin, we get it. it we get, we're denaturing the proteins, so w- that's okay to an extent. But well, this is the reason you don't have blackened, you know, meat on the on the barbecue because it's so denatured that yeah, it's now don't, don't no know, it's, longer, it's carcinogenic. Right, it, that it's no longer even food; it's now a poison. Like you've denatured it so far that it's gonna it's gonna do you harm, not do you you good. So. In, in the pet food industry, you have acrylamides being con- created out of the superheating. You have um, uh, ages, um, remind me, that uh, I've just got a mental blank on what ages actually stands for. Advanced glycation end products. There we go. That's what it is. So you, so you have all of these sort of carcinogenic chemicals that are being created through superheating meat. Um, and it, it's starting to putrefy as well. So then they have to put preservatives in there. So you the child, and it's gray. So now they add the coloring. So it looks like it's red or brown or something that looks a bit more meaty. And then because it's it's disgusting, they add these things called palatants, which are things that are supposed to make it taste great, right? But they're as addictive to co- as cocaine. So now your pets are addicted to something that is putrefacted meat, dyed, sprayed, this desiccate, like there's not even any decent moisture in there. So as soon as you start eating that, you cause chronic dehydration in the body because mm. that, that food needs to be moistened for it to be broken down. So water is being pulled out of the cells of the body. It's just the cascade of poison and terror that this does on the body. And these poor animals have been eating it every single meal not even every day but every meal right? for awful. however long because your vet told you to buy this thing because your vet unfortunately didn't learn nutrition or your tv tells you to buy this thing because this is pet food so it's we just need to just understand that real food makes you healthy and makes you live a long time and junk food will do the reverse I hear that and it freaks me out and it's like, holy cow, is there hope for our animals? And then I stop and I'm thinking, holy crap, as humans, we're doing that to ourselves. 
Like we're openly doing it to ourselves. And then you mentioned it's addictive like cocaine. So scientifically, they've proven that sugar is eight right. times more addictive than cocaine. And the human foods, they add sugars or artificial sweeteners, which are anywhere from two times sweeter to thousands times sweeter. So the addiction without a doubt is there. And when we eat these foods, there's no doubt where it's like, oh, it's really tough. And if you tell me I can't have it, Penny, I, I get the Romeo effect, which is like, you can't tell me that I can or can't have something. You know, and, and the message I want to have for people is you can consume whatever poison you want. I, with what we do here, I want you to be aware of the cause and effect of it. Right. So it, it's not a shock of, oh, so I turned 49 this month. And a lot of the individuals that, that I went to school with, that, that my peers mm. are, are on multiple meds. There's been a couple of strokes, heart attacks. And I'm like, wow, you know, my goal is to keep up to where I was at 24, 25 years old. And for the most part, I am outside of injuries from cage fighting and other fun stuff that I've done the past 20 plus years of my life. So it's, it's the, you've got the ability to reverse that. It's be aware of the foods that we're told are food is really feed, which is toxic and it's a poison. And when you do get species appropriate food, it reverses. Hey, there's hope. That's a message I want for you today is like, there is hope. If you're seeing signs of, wow, I'm aging and there's disease in the horizon Studies have showed time and time again that many of them are reversible. I got to watch how I say that so we don't get banned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> but yes. You Not can. saying that it will happen so we don't get banned. Just telling you that there's a bunch of examples that it has been reversed. Mm. Across the species lines. There you go, fact checkers. <laughs> Uh, okay, so wrap it up in closing. What do you what do you want them to to remember on what you said today? I mean, if you love your pets and dread the day of having to say goodbye to them, start doing something about it now. Think about humans also. It's not just pets. Think about humans, yourself, and your family members. Yes. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> it's the same principles right so when you build those principles into your life and make them part of your daily actions right and, and none of this is complicated like you're already going to feed your dog you're already going to feed your family right so it's just making a switch it's making a smarter choice and often when our, when my clients will will change over from the the kibble to real food the food we got bills goes down Right, because the animal doesn't need to have as much quantity because Every the quality time. is so superior. So it's it's an investment not just in terms of their quality of life today, but their length of life for tomorrow. How long you get to have them in your family? How far in advance you push off having disease manifestation? Right, you don't have symptoms coming in when you're in optimized form. You just you don't do it because your immune system gets to those things before they even have a chance to raise their head. So you're always full of energy, you're never getting sick, and you're staying in that stage of full functioning rather than your life is limiting down on you, right? And so I want to close with that because a lot of individuals, when they hear living longer, they're thinking being miserable longer. Yeah. So, so they're, they're so visualizing my dog gets sick at a certain age because all dogs do, or we as humans get sick at a certain age, whatever it is in their heads in their sixties or their seventies. And when they hear Esteban say it to 147, they're like, Oh wow, that's going to be another 70 years of just being in the hospital and living miserable. No, what Penny and I are saying is your play span, your vitality, yeah. your longevity, all of that. And, and it's, it's actually at a higher level than the highest level was before with the poisonous toxic right. Humans are eating the kibble also. Yeah. Awesome. We'll see you guys next week. Love ya.